Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll start with a couple of confessions. First, uh, Sao Ping uh, made me feel very bad, right? That's an actual science talk. I'm a computer scientist by training, and as they say, everything that has science in its name probably isn't one. Um, and so, so we'll go back to more engineering-focused uh, topics now. Um, the, the other aspect, this was a rich uh, corpora of probably uh, 20 years of research. Uh, we started this work two years ago. So maybe, maybe not quite the, uh, the, the big picture here. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is deep autoregressive generative modeling with applications to prediction of human activity. Uh, why? Well, when Siu and Andreas asked me uh, what I was going to talk about, this is what I taught in my class. Uh, that's, that's the truth. Uh, the, the other aspect is that what we do in our research is all about understanding human activity. Right? And there's lots of, uh, lots of application domains uh, from special effects in movies, uh, animation, to uh, human-robot interaction, um, sports and, and physical rehabilitation, and so forth. Right? And for all of these application domains, you need to understand uh, what humans are doing, and in particular, you need to understand the dynamics. Um, and that's what we're specialized on. So we do a lot of... Um, uh, tracking of people, hands in particular, eyes. Um, I'm not going to talk about much of this today, but that's the underlying um, motivation. Um, yeah, and then there's been a lot of progress in this domain, uh, driven by, uh, by deep learning, by CNNs, um, and in particular, in the beginning, at least, in terms of discriminative models, right? Very simple idea, um, or a very simple picture of a discriminative model after you've trained it. Uh, you press a button um, after you receive an, receive an input X, and then you give it a label. This is an image of a cat. Right? A generative model is also uh, a, a simple box with a button, uh, but if you press the button, then um, it produces a novel uh, it, it produces a novel label, right? or a novel no, sorry, not a novel label, a novel image. Right? So one time you press the button, it could be a cat, next time you press the button. It could be um, a dog or something else, um, right? And so generating something from nothing uh, normally doesn't work, right? So uh, typically these models really take uh, noise as input, then they learn a function that maps this noise to the output domain. Um, and in the case of natural images, that would be, well, pixels. Right, and then there's another, uh, the last box that I want to briefly, briefly show, and those are uh, conditional generative models that not only take a noise vector as input, um, but also take um, some other form of input that steers uh, the generation, right? So I may actually put in what type of image I want, whether I want a cat or, or a dog image, right? And then hopefully when I press the green button, uh, the right thing comes out. So why? Why uh, is this interesting, right? So in this talk, we're going to focus on um, generative models, and in particular on probabilistic generative models. Um, so uh, basically models that can uh, generate conditionally and that can uh, basically produce a distribution that I can draw samples from. Right, so this may be interesting um, if you're actually interested in predicting into the future. You can draw different samples and get different representations of possible future events. Right, so uh, in the context of, of driverless cars, autonomous driving, um, this should sound interesting in the context even of simple people tracking. Right, so you can predict different trajectories um, and then later see which of the future observations match best best to your, uh, generated, uh, to your generated samples. And so um, there's lots of uh, interesting applications, uh, and there's lots of attention, of course, also currently in computer vision to generating natural images, right? So the, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, obviously, is uh, our GANs. Um, and this is the progress on um, learning-based image uh, synthesis using these generative adversarial networks, right? Uh, in, in very few years, in four years, from grainy black and white pictures, we went all the way to what's, to me, at least indistinguishable from, from real faces. Um, another area uh, are, or another class of generative models, I'm not going to talk about GANs uh, at all today, just as a... Uh, 
a little bit of warning. Um, another class that's very popular in computer vision also that I'm only going to touch briefly upon our uh, variational autoencoders. Um, so this is work that we've uh, presented at, at CVPR last year, um, basically where we use a generative model for hand pose estimation. And there's two things that are interesting. Uh, the first one is if you use such a generative model, then it can outperform uh, discriminative approaches even on a discriminative task, right? If you only predict the, uh, the joint positions um, of the hand. But of course, you get this additional um, nice side effect that you can generate novel configurations, right? So what we did here basically is we take two real images project them into the latent space of the variational autoencoder and then walk along uh, the manifold. And then you can generate both uh, and, and importantly consistent pairs of hand posts and images. Of course, the images are not at the same level of, of image quality than what you've seen from GANs before. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you, you get this nice effect that you can create new samples. And in that paper, we actually show that this can then help in training in a semi-supervised uh, fashion. Yeah, the same thing also works for, for depth images. So the same method um, kind of generalizes across uh, RGB 2D images and um, RGBD images. And you know you could say that this is because uh, the model learns something about the underlying physical model of the motion. Okay, so those are kind of GANs and, and VAEs. Th those are actually the class of uh, generative models that you're probably already all familiar with, and I won't really uh, talk about them. Um, uh, won't talk about them in the remainder of, of, of today's talk. What I do want to talk about is models that are specifically well suited for predictive time series uh, modeling. Right, so here's one task uh, that's seen a lot of attention in computer vision, where you're basically given a seed sequence of poses that could be extracted from images or could come from a motion capture system. Um, and then the task is to either over a short time horizon or a long time horizon predict um, the motions, right, the future motions. So, some of the application scenarios that I mentioned earlier would, would benefit from this. And this is uh, a preview of one of the methods that I'm going to talk about later, or an application of one of the methods that I'm going to talk about later, um, but I can't really disclose many of the, of the details here. Um, so, but what's interesting about this particular approach is that you have a probabilistic model that can produce, if you want, alternative futures, right? So you can uh, generate plausible motions over relatively long time horizons, and you can test different hypotheses. Okay, so um, now I spend a lot of words on what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, let's try to get to what I am going to talk about. In general, uh, you can create this taxonomy of generative models. This is uh, borrowed from Ian Goodfellow, of course, where uh, you have GANs in the family of um, implicit density models, so you never actually have access to the density function. And then you have a family of models that have an explicit, explicit density representation, right? So you have a probability distribution um, of images that you uh, sample from. Um, and then there's the variational autoencoder and Boltzmann machines that approximate an intractable uh, density function and then uh, there is a family of models, and that's the one that I want to talk about today, that actually have a tractable um, density function. So you can really uh, compute the PDF, uh, and you can very simply sample from it. Um, and these are called autoregressive uh, generative models. Um, now, there's a, there's a lot of work, right? Uh, the law of deep learning tells you that Bengi and Hinton did it all uh, in the early 2000s. And then there's typically uh, a, a school of people that did it again with deep neural networks, um, like roughly 10 years ago. Um, and so Nate and Mate are examples of the second wave. And then um, there's a, a third wave, if you want, that also shows uh, very interesting applications to vision tasks. Um, yeah. So the outline for today then is kind of falls into two parts. Um, when I asked Andreas what type of talk he wants, 
He said, teach for 45 minutes and only then talk about your research. I think I'm the only one who took this literally. Uh, apologies for that. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of background, right? So the, the school part in uh, the computer vision summer school, where we kind of give a, a short history on these uh, deep autoregressive models. None of this is our own work. Right, so this is this is basically the work that we built on, um, and then I'm going to talk about some of our own um, work in the in the second half. Okay, so why why are autoregressive models called um, autoregressive? Well, because they fulfill what's what's known as the autoregressive uh, property. Right, so a this is the most simple simplest possible uh, regression model. Right, so you have a linear combination of the inputs, and that gives you an estimate, y hat in this case. Right, and, and this uh, linear combination can obviously also be applied to time series data. Right, so here we have um, one input, two coefficients. Here we have the same input at different time steps. Right, but again, a linear combination of the same input variable at different time steps. What's important is that um, there is no direct computational pass from xt, so the, uh, the prediction variable at the same time step, right? So it's xt minus 1, xt minus 2 that predict xt. Um, and because, well, this, this model basically receives inputs from itself, if you continue this into the future, it's regression of itself, and hence um, uh, this is called autoregressive models. And so, obviously, I don't even need to put a slide up on this, that uh, recurrent neural networks fulfill the autoregressive property if uh, trained and, and tested in a particular configuration. Um, so what all these, um, what all these autoregressive or current state-of-the-art autoregressive models attempt to do is um, they basically try to learn the joint distribution over data, right? So this could be over natural images, um, over pixels, over audio. A lot of the work actually right now is in audio and speech synthesis. Um, and as you can see, don't look too closely uh, because uh, some of the indexing is not entirely right. But what's nice is that with um, different input dimensionality, you can apply the very same idea to different types of, of data, right? Temporal data, uh, 2D, 3D data, and so forth. And here's some representatives of, uh, of these different ideas. Um, and so, yeah, what's going on here basically is that we need to find the joint distribution uh, if we're talking about images over all possible images. Right, and that makes the, this a, a pretty hard task. Why is that the case? Well, it's a explicit density function, right? Probabilities have to add up to one. So if I now give probability to a random image, then by necessity, I have to reduce the probability of a real image, right? So I have to get this right everywhere. And this makes, uh, makes actually training such, mod such, such models tricky, but if successful, it allows us to sample, yeah? So how does this connect with the old stuff like n-grams, you know, Shannon, and, like, and the, the, the image-based stuff like Popat and Picard in the 90s, basically doing this kind of uh, auto-regressive things with like, you know, uh, K-means clustering? Um, it seems like people don't talk about that anymore, but right? it seems very connected. Well, I mean, a lot of these models, I, I'm not entirely sure about the second half of uh, the papers that you mentioned. I'm not super familiar with those. But a lot of this stuff is used almost everywhere where you have time series data. So um, this, uh, you know, I know that, for example, Walmart uses uh, the simplest version that I had on the, on the first slide, actually, because they know, you know, before Christmas people buy stuff. So they hand tune those parameters to predict what they should keep on, on shelves and whatnot. So this has been around for, for a long time. Um, uh, I guess I, I have two slides now why you should parameterize it via neural network and not via um, a fixed set of parameters. This is really the main thing that, that has changed. Um, yeah, and then, then we'll see that now it, it starts to work on pretty interesting ta tasks. Um, it's not quite as, quite as prominent, I guess, in computer vision yet. 
Um, I mean, we have a little bit of work in our lab that looks promising. It's not yet done. So we'll see if, uh, if this really will uh, get, get gather attention in computer vision as well. But it's, it's used a lot outside. Does that roughly answer your question? I, 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 I mean, this kind of stuff was prominent, like protection services back in the day. Right, right. right. And, and so it's, it seems like, it, so it, do, do you say, are you saying that this is basically just take the old stuff, add a neural network, and then you're basically, you're sampling through a neural network instead of directly on pixels? Um, so, the, for example, Nate and Mate, that's exactly, yes, that's what that is. Yeah, and then there's newer versions that are different that actually, I mean, the main, the main competitor, if you want, are actually RNNs, right? So you can, I'll show you later that you can beat uh, very, very high-end RNNs and you get rid of the uh, explicit temporal, temporal consistency, which gives you a lot of uh, computational wins. Right, you can train these models on the same data as an RNN in an hour and a half versus days, right, on, on lar large audio sets. Wouldn't the metaverse be NRAMs much simpler and work quite better? Yes, but then you have to, I mean, you then have to specify exactly, you know, how, what the N is, right, and this kind of, you tune. Maybe we'll, we'll take it offline, but there's, you know, there's a lot of people that have this attention is all you need, right? Um, attitude in, in audio synthesis where you try to, basically you try just to learn which of the samples from the past, which sparse samples from the past influence your prediction. And that's what these models are, are pretty good at, basically, right? So it, it takes that, that engineering out to some degree. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, basically what we want to do, right, is we want to um, compute the joint probability. Uh, in terms of notation, this here, uh, this means that you take all the inputs up to i, and this of course implies that you have some ordering, right? So this could be from, in images from the top, top left pixel uh, just by scan line. It could be random ordering as long as that ordering is fixed. Right? So you have all previous um, inputs up to i, um, and they are used to condition the probability or the likelihood of the ith um, element of, of some time series. Right? And via the chain rule of probabilities, this can be factorized. Um, and then you can use straight up tabular methods um, to then actually compute, compute these um, conditionals. Um, if you were to do this for the nth um, element, x of n, then you need to keep all the possible combinations, right? So x, x2 given x1 and x2 given x1, x2 given x1 and x2 and so forth. So that gives you an exponential number of parameters, 2 to the power of n minus 1. Um, and obviously, uh, this doesn't scale to large, uh, large n's. So... Um, a different attempt would be to do this with a fixed number of parameters, right? So here's a very simple parameterization where you have basically a function that compu computes the mean um, of a Bernoulli distribution, and then this could be used for binary predictions, right? This would either be uh, one or zero. Um, and now you have a fixed number of parameters. Um, if you do this, for example, via logistic re regression, then you have uh, n square or order of n square number of parameters. It's much better, but you still have this problem that Alyosha mentioned, that you have to decide how many um, parameters you're going to use, right? And, and the number of parameters somehow has to match the number of inputs. So there's no direct way to scale this up. And this is where... Um, uh, well, uh, Hugo and La Rochelle and, and colleagues came in and said, so why don't we parameterize this via a neural network, right? So uh, it's still the same idea. You have the joint probability. You want to compute the likelihood, let's say, of an image. Um, and uh, this is computed via um, if a looking at the, the conditional probability or the product of conditional probabilities given a fixed order of previous um, pixels in this case. 
right? And then, um, well, the, the idea really is just to replace uh, the parameterization with the neural network. And so 20, 2011, um, this is Nate, um, which basically uh, uses a neural network with a slightly peculiar uh, parameterization to do uh, this task where you have your inputs, so these are the x's, and up there would be your, uh, your conditional probabilities. Right? Um, as before, uh, this is for binary predictions, um, and a specific trick is that you do basically uh, parameter sharing. Right? So uh, first you start by putting in basically a hidden layer um, into a activation function, sigmoid function, um, in the first case, there's no inputs connected to it, right? So this is just the sigmoid of B, which computes H of I. Um, and then you have another uh, mapping from the hidden state to the, to the output, to your output prediction. Um, and then basically this is one of your, um, of your conditional probabilities, which you then feed um, as an input and you rinse and repeat, right? So you basically... Uh, then compute all the, uh, all the conditional probabilities and the product of those gives you uh, the joint probability distribution that we're after. Um, two aspects that, uh, that are interesting here um, is basically this, like these blue lines here indicate that you always use the same network, right? So it's a very efficient parameterization. Um, and basically what you need to do if you get a new sample, you basically just take one more row of your, uh, sorry, one more column of your weight matrix um, and multiply your input with this, right? Uh, and then for the outputs, uh, you do a similar trick where you simply use the ith row. So uh, this is just to explain that notation here. Um, the reason why you would do this and the reason why you would do any of this is computational efficiency. Right? So these, uh, all these models are not necessarily at the same modeling power than, let's say, GANs and VAEs, but they're much more efficient. Right? So to, uh, to, uh, to get an idea what's actually going on here, right? like if you compute um, the, the output or the, the hidden uh, layer for the xi plus 1's input, then what you need to do is append another column to your weight matrix, do the vector matrix multiplication. But if you compare uh, this computation with what you've done previously, um, then basically only the i plus one's column of that matrix really remains, right? So all you have to do um, is a vector vector uh, multiplication. And so this makes this uh, both at inference and training time really fast. Another uh, nice aspect about this um, is uh, that training is simply done by maximizing the, uh, the log likelihood, right? So um, anyone here who has worked with scans? Yeah, quite a few of those. So uh, what this means basically is that you can compare different models by just comparing the numerical value of the uh, NNL, NLL negative log likelihood score that they produce. Does that sound nice comparing to evaluating GANs? To me it does, right? It gives you, it gives you a metric where you can say this model performs better um, than another model in a generative setting. Of course, whether that then um, uh, correlates to qualitative performance is yet another question. Mm -hmm. So the, the W's are, the, the W matrix is fixed at training time at a fixed size, or is it it's ever a, being updated during inference, right? It's yeah, you, you train it and then it stays the same, but you use different columns of it, right, different parts. But do I have to know the number of columns in advance? Uh, so for my inference task, does it have to be the same? It's a fixed size, fixed size matrix. Right, and then you have to set a ordering on the x's, and you also have to set a number of, of x's for this particular okay. setting, right? Otherwise, that trick doesn't work. Okay. So in this case, right, there's, uh, there's three is the maximum size of columns in this 
example and you feed three inputs into this, right, in, in, in chunks. So that you have to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the, the basic, basic idea behind Nate. Uh, there's lots of extension to this, to real valued and, uh, and other things. Um, just for comparison, I guess, uh, you know, all of us are more familiar with the outputs of more, let's say, powerful uh, generative models, um, but this is 2011, right? So this is uh, uh, MNIST results in 2011, um, where I guess the, the left side is samples um, drawn from the distribution, right, which is uh, one of the other benefits that I mentioned. It's nice, you have access to P of X and you can draw samples from it. Um, um, and then the middle is basically, uh, the middle is the probabilities. So this is, yeah, this is the probabilities. Um, and these are uh, samples of the weights, which, um, which I think corresponds a little bit to your question, right? So you have. And while you're showing us the images here, what's really going on is that there's some sequence of pixels in a row. Exactly, it's yeah. really being treated as some. Um, yeah, yes, okay. yes. Exactly, yeah. Um, and this is, in, this is the case for all of what I'm going to show you, is that you take um, a random, this is all generated actually in random ordering, but it's predefined, the ordering, right? So you, you select one, um, and then you generate it sequentially. Um, and then, yeah, here these are, are basically individual pixels, so the, uh, the brighter a pixel in here is, um, the higher the probability that this would be a foreground pixel. Uh, I'll skip the extensions. These are, yeah, these are different versions of Nate. Um, but clearly what you can see um, is that this is, is producing something that looks like, um, looks like MNIST samples, but it's not very great visual quality. Um, so the next attempt, uh, and this is now 2015, is made. Uh, another nice acronym, which basically uh, tries to, to change the autoencoder framework so that it fulfills the autoregressive property, right? So normally in an autoencoder, all the outputs are connected to all the inputs because you need to reconstruct exactly the input. So this, uh, this generative story is not there, right? An autoencoder cannot really create novel, uh, novel samples because there will always be a path from one of the inputs to the outputs. Um, and so the, the central idea here is that you basically create a mask um, that knocks out connections between some of the hidden layers and the output layers such that there's no connection from um, a particular input to the uh, particular conditional, right? Um, so here's, here's an example maybe. Um, so again, you pick an order in this, uh, in, in, in this instance, a random ordering of the inputs. So x2 is the first one, um, x1 is the third, and uh, x3 is the second. And then um, you should, and you can verify this by looking at the errors, right? Like for the third input and the third conditional, there's no pass. Actually, this is not connected to anything. Um, and uh, if you look at the light gray errors, you can uh, verify the same thing, and for the dark gray errors as well. So the way uh, this mask is found is actually a very, very simple trick, right? You basically sample um, random integers, and then um, you only connect uh, the layer below a particular node if that integer that you sampled is greater or equal to the integer that's in the layer below it, right? So two is not greater or equal than three, so there's no connection but two is greater or equal to one, um, so it's fully connected here. And then uh, for, the, for the output, um, you do basically the same, only uh, that you say that you drop the equal condition, so the output actually has to be um, greater and then it will be connected, right? So three is connected to twos and ones. One is not uh, greater than any of them, so it's not connected at all. Right? Uh, and this gives you these masks that you can then apply directly onto your weight matrix. 
And this, in fact, and there's a proof in the paper, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip this, of course, that shows that then an autoencoder um, fulfills the autoregressive property. Right? So again, you have the, the same nice property that you have uh, negative log likelihood for training. Um, computing P of X is just a matter of uh, performing a forward pass through the autoencoder. Um, sampling requires several passes, but it's still relatively fast. Um, here again, some, some outputs of this. Uh, there's a binarized MNIST. Again, um, in practice, I think these things uh, only work if you have huge hidden layers. Um, but the, the general idea is, a, is an important one uh, that all of us probably know and use quite often. Because this actually led to, to two models that are really state of the art in, in uh, several tasks and several subtasks in vision and audio processing and so forth. So this is uh, Nate and Mate and the autoregressive property. Those are kind of the, the ideas that I want you to, to keep in mind um, as we go forward to more state-of-the-art things. There are questions at this point? Okay, good. So um, the next uh, model that I briefly want to... Factorizing the joint probability, the joint yeah. Um, but I don't see, so that implies some traditional independence assumption, um, and I don't see that, I didn't see that come out here. So is it, where is it, how is it factorized? So here, here you actually see the individual. Yeah, I see it, but yeah. and, and someone decides that in advance, or? Y so yes, you, you do, you always need to, decide the ordering, right? Which output produces which conditional and which input is, is uh, processed in so which ordering. It, but in, in the name one, did it, I didn't see it. it yes, this is because I normally scribble on my slides and I didn't scribble it onto that slide. But okay. uh, I think I have, it, I have it somewhere. But you have the same, the same thing. There, the same assumption that each output, and let's go back to Nate. Maybe I can actually show you, yeah, this one. Uh, so this is how I teach it in class. Uh, so you have the individual conditional probabilities here. Each of them produces one, and the ordering is, is predefined. Um, if you do it sequentially, then this would be P of x1, this would be P of x2, given x1, and so forth. And then the product over all of them is P of x. Mm -hmm. um, where were we? Yeah, so um, in uh, computer vision, right, lots of people use this model, uh, pixel RNNs, uh, pixel CNNs, which actually are a direct follow-up to MATE. Um, the, as I said, right, RNNs uh, by, by design almost fulfill the autoregressive uh, property. Not really going to talk about how, how this works and all the different variants that are explored in the paper because people in computer vision know anyways. Um, so what you do is you basically fix the ordering to start at the top left corner and then you use an RNN to predict um, the pixels going outwards. Right? So the dependency on previous pixels here is modeled using an, an LSTM. Right? And so you kind of uh, sequentially uh, generate this image. And the, the obvious issue here is that the sequential generation process is slow, especially if the image is large, then uh, this is going to take a lot of time. Um, and of course, the, the direct modeling of dependencies in RNN makes both generation and training uh, very slow. Um, pixel CNNs uh, are kind of very, sim have very similar idea, only now that the dependency of pixels is modeled via the receptive field of the CNN, right? So to predict the central pixel, um, you take uh, the, the surrounding pixels as input, um, and then one by one uh, predict the, the, the current pixel, right? Again, uh, training is done via maximizing the log likelihood of, of training images, um, and this uh, using a CNN to model the dependency speeds up training, um, generation is still, uh, is still slow. Hang on. Uh, 
so the um, the 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 way you basically uh, mask the masked out the connections in a convolution um, is done in in pixel C and, and actually via autoregression over um, over the colors, right? So um, you basically at the lowest level you connect everything in intermediate levels to the context, to the red and the green channel, but not to the blue channel, right? And this um, then gives you uh, yeah autoregression over the color channels, but it fulfills the same um, the same property as made. Right? It also gives you the same efficiency, at least in the forward pass, um, but it kind of circumvents this more complicated uh, construction of, of the model itself and the connectivity. Okay, so there's, there's lots of additional tricks on pixel CNN that I'm going to skip for the uh, interest of time. Again, um, to kind of compare with the state of the art in generative uh, adversarial modeling, even with VAEs, this is sort of, um, well, maybe was back then, uh, 2015, was uh, competitive. So you see something that probably from where you are uh, looks like natural images. Um, if you look closer, it's mostly random, uh, random pixels that kind of maybe sometimes uh, portray things. Um, but again, um, the, the nice property is that you can actually create these tables. Uh, you can look at the negative log likelihood and, and compare um, which model is performing better, at least in terms of, of that metric. Um, pixel CNNs, of course, have been extended to conditional generation. So this is a follow-up paper uh, from NIPS 2016, uh, where now you can really make out uh, things. So this is, yep. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned this earlier that it doesn't always uh, correlate uh, very well, but in many tasks it does, right? So if you have a lower uh, uh, negative log likelihood um, or higher likelihood of a particular image um, on the test data set, then typically the samples actually are uh, of higher quality. Right, so at, at least in audio this really correlates quite well. If you have a low likelihood, then you get a, a bad sample. If you have a high likelihood, then you get a better sample, right? So and so, you, you supply the first pixel and then try to generate the next one measurable accuracy. Yes, sample. yes, okay. so yes, yeah. Um, so yeah, you do it on with ground truth data. Um, it basically in in a reconstruction setting, okay. right? So you take an image, and then you compute the likelihood of that image, and then you compare it to to what your model predicts. Um, I think I had this on the slides earlier. Uh, okay. Um, I forgot what I wanted to say about conditional image generation, but basically this shows that you can provide a class label as input with extensions to pixel CNN and then um, actually control the generation, which will become important uh, later on. Um, yeah. So... In summary, uh, that's kind of like the, the school part, um, right? So we, we looked at uh, these autoregressive generative models. I like them because they give you this likelihood uh, explicit density function that you can sample from. Um, the, what we just discussed, uh, the, the likelihood also, uh, at least sometimes, is a meaningful metric. Um, and on many tasks, at least state-of-the-art models produce good samples. Mm -hmm. So, like, obviously, um, you know, this 
structures are not sequentially generated. They're not they sequentially are, generated, it just yeah. It doesn't reflect the underlying. Yeah. Yes, and you can actually see this. If you look into the sample, sometimes you really see like scanning artifacts, right? Yeah. Like especially if you at, at uh, you know um, transitions from like a homogeneous background to a very heterogeneous region, you s you see these uh, the artifacts. Um, all of these papers typically explore the ordering and the generation pattern, um, but I mean the the underlying problem exists, right? That you always have you know, your condition on everything that you've done before. If you do something wrong before, then yeah. you're going to continue to do something wrong. Um, and actually, yeah, I, d I don't have a real solution for that, right? Uh, uh, this, is, this is part of... Uh, uh, just a different class of models. That yeah. yeah, this is one of, uh, certainly one of the weaknesses. Actually, the, the Nate paper explores this in the most detail. That looks at really all the possible uh, orderings. And uh, so the conclusion is that random actually works best rather than sequential. But then more modern uh, models typically do it sequentially. Um, yeah, so um, the kind of the next uh, class of models, and this will actually bring us to our own research um, that I briefly want to talk about are temporal convolutional networks. Um, or better known as WaveNet. Um, so this is pretty much the thing that powers uh, Google's Assistant, right? The speech synthesis um, in in the Google Assistant, which is pretty good. Um, you know, most of us are more interested in pixels, um, but audio is actually uh, ar well. You could argue that it's a more challenging. Um, Problem in this setting, it certainly is because you have a much higher dimensionality, right? So every sample um, has, uh, or every second, you have 16,000 samples, and uh, the data sets actually have very long sequences already. So this is very high dimensional, and remember, you need to define an, an ordering um, on them. Um, so before we talk uh, more about, actually, I won't talk much about audio, but uh, t WaveNet is, is, is all about audio. Um, so let's do a quick detour and talk a little bit about the importance of context, right? Uh, this is actually slides that I stole from Fisher, Fisher U. Um, so uh, this is about the importance of context, right? So we're going to play a little game and you're going to classify whether this is a cat or a dog. Cat. Two cats. Everyone else thinks this is a dog. Come on, raise your hand for cats. Keeps you from not falling asleep. Few people think it's a cat. Okay. Um, how about now? Cat or dog? Ra ra neither. <laughs> neither. Uh, it's binary classification. Raise your hand for cats. Still two. Okay. Everyone else thinks it's a dog. How about now? Some people switch back to cats. It's, uh, it's in the dog people won out. It's, in fact, the dog. Um, the more, obviously, the more you see, uh, the easier this task becomes. You don't need to see all the details, right? Like, what's important really is uh, having the context to the details. Um, here's basically the, the filter size, if you want so, of a convolutional kernel or the receptive field size. Right? And the quicker you expand this, uh, the easier it should be to solve that classification task. Right? And this is where uh, uh, the idea of dilated convolutions came in and rightfully a very influential paper. Um, a lot of us probably know this, so I can be quick. Um, the idea is to simply um, stride the support of the convolutional kernel. Right? So instead of uh, using, using a <laughs> densely packed kernel, um, you keep the, the number of elements in your kernel the same, but you stride them. Right? Um, so, which in fact then uh, turns at very few levels of depth to a very large receptive field size. Right? So here, uh, red is basically the footprint. So where are the individual pixels of your uh, convolution kernel on the image? Um, the shaded part is the uh, is the receptive field size um, for a single layer of convolutions. 
and then on the next slide, there will be darker areas where you have actually receptive fields overlapping. Right, and then uh, so, so this is uh, with very few layers. Uh, so this is three layers of dilated convolutions, or actually a convolution where at each layer you increase the dilation, right? So the distance between uh, where you place the pixels or where you place the kernel elements over the pixels increases with every level. And then at three levels, uh, you cover a very large area um, of the image, which should help in telling whether it's a cat or a dog, right? Um, not sure if this place, this is an animation um, of the different convolutions. You can see that I, I stole the slides from an actual class, so uh, maybe a bit more detail than you need. Um, and so, yeah, these dilated convolutions have been very, uh, very influential in computer vision, but they're also the backbone of WaveNet. Um, so the idea is in WaveNet that you use these dil dilated convolutions over the entire sequence of your inputs, right? All your audio samples um, here in blue, and then um, at each hidden layer, you increase the dilation. So with very few layers, um, you will uh, get to a very large receptive field size, um, typically uh, covering the entire input sequence, right? And then um, the intuition would be that by being able to look at the whole sequence, you get a very good understanding of the, uh, of the input signal um, without having to look at everything, right? And without, in particular, needing very deep uh, CNN architectures. Right, so you get uh, a, a very large receptive field. Here's a direct comparison on the same sequence with a regular uh, convolution and then dilated convolutions, which, which gives you a very uh, large field. Uh, yeah, so, so this is WaveNet. Um, I'll get back to that uh, after, after a little detour. Right, so we're still talking about this. We're still talking about autoregressive models. Uh, WaveNet is uh, an, an autoregressive model. Um, but first, uh, I want to talk about some, some of our own work that basically establish a bit of a baseline for uh, a WaveNet-like uh, architecture af afterwards. So as I said, um, RNNs are basically uh, a class of models that inherently fulfill the autoregressive uh, property. Right, so the hidden layer uh, summarizes the input seen up to t minus one, and then um, if I predict uh, the next time step, that basically is the uh, parameterization of the output conditional that we're after. Right, so drawn as a graphical model, you kind of get get this uh, image here. This is from the straight up from the deep learning book, right, where you take uh, the input, you compute your um, your hidden layer state. And then the output uh, itself becomes the next uh, input to the RNN, right? And then that's uh, basically uh, an autoregressive uh, setting or the autoregressive setting. What I briefly want to show um, is, is really uh, where currently the state of the art is. We, we think RNN and then take an LSTM. Um, if you look at the actual performance, a class of RNNs that embeds a stochastic latent uh, variable in the RNN is actually what outperforms uh, most RNN architectures by a large margin on many tasks. So what we're going to talk about is, uh, is a combination um, of an RNN with a variational latent model. Um, so the idea is to increase the expressive power of RNNs by using um, a, a, a latent variable layer. Um, so uh, the task that we did this on is generative model modeling of digital handwriting. Maybe not so interesting for, uh, for computer vision folks, but it's basically a time series, right? So the task is you have um, 2D coordinates um, along the stroke and then given, well, actually in E you would draw this way, given like a, a subset of um, stroke elements predict the next or uh, predict the future of strokes, right? That's the task. And RNNs typically have been evaluated on this, right? So uh, um, what's important here, I'm not going to recap RNNs, is that the transition function that takes, 
uh, the previous hidden time step um, and the input at the current time step and computes the value uh, of the hidden value at time t um, is deterministic, right? That's, that's important here. Um, everything else uh, you probably know. So um, this is kind of uh, from Alex Gravis, early work 2013. Um, this already produces pretty good looking um, input. You can even bias this uh, for towards the style of a particular user by training it with lots of samples. Um, then a couple of years later, um, Chung et al. proposed, uh, uh, that's not actually called uh, VRNNs, but everybody else calls it VRNNs, so I'll do two, um, which is basically a VAE, a variational autoencoder, embedded in an RNN. Um, and primarily, uh, so the graphical model works like this. Um, you take your hidden state and your input, you use that to update a latent variable, and then you sample from that latent variable to produce uh, the hidden state at time t. And primarily what this actually does is it regularizes training, right? Because you have stochasticity um, in the training process and the model needs to learn uh, to deal with that. So that actually makes VRNNs a lot more robust uh, than, than traditional RNNs. So the, the main difference for the purpose of, of today is that now the transition function tau here uh, depends still on ht minus one and xt, but it also depends on the sample that you draw from, uh, from the uh, random variable. Um, here's uh, output from, from a VRNN, which kind of is much more consistent in terms of style, um, but you have no control over what it produces, right? So there's, uh, there's no real conditioning. I briefly want to talk about um, uh, work that my student Emre did, uh, presented last year, which basically takes ideas from both um, and adds conditioning on top of it, right? So there's, again, a, a variational RNN, um, but you now produce conditional probabilities, right? So what this means is basically um, that you get a model that can produce very high quality samples of ha handwritten ink. So this is completely synthetic um, in the style of different authors. I think the top one is Fabrizio, the second one is Emre. Um, ooh, and it gives you complete control um, over individual stroke elements, right? So here we basically do a, uh, we hook it up to an API for, for uh, character recognition and then do um, correction and editing of individual words without losing the style, right? So it's consistent with uh, the previous uh, elements in the time series. Here we go. <laughs> um, so these are um, basically two random variables, right? Um, that uh, encode different aspects, right? So pi is a continu continuous random variable that encaptures, or we assume that it cap encapsulates the style, right? So slant and you know your personal characteristics, and then uh, pi is uh, a, a discrete um, distribution that really encodes the content, so the ASCII characters, if you want. Right? And a traditional uh, variational autoencoder only has one, only has a Z, so uh, here there's a disentangling of factors. Right? And you can um, basically see this in two ways. One is you provide uh, text as input, and then you try to uh, well disentangle the style from the content, uh, which is kind of shown as a graphical model here or um, you try to take a style vector, right, which is kind of latent representation of your handwriting um, and give it some different uh, ASCII characters as input and then you synthesize new samples. Um, the whole thing um, is trained um, via, uh, in this case, the, the elbow. Um, so very similar actually to a variational autoencoder only that encoder and decoder are RNNs in this case. And there's a few tricks on shaping, um, on shaping the approximate posterior distributions for style and content. I can't really go into all the details. I'll, I'll briefly try to uh, 
try to summarize it, right? So there's, as I said, the, the Q, the approximate posterior of the style, and then Q of uh, pi of T, which is the approximate posterior of the content. Um, and then this whole thing is a dynamical system. Uh, so these, these black dots here are basically RNNs, right? So they take the hidden state from the previous time step um, and at training time, a current sample is input, uh, compute the updates for the uh, latent variables. Um, there's an IKL divergence uh, with the respective uh, distributions. And then you sample from both of them and reconstruct at training time the same sample, right? So this is xt and that's um, x hat t, so uh, it happens at the same time. And then you also uh, use the, the stroke element and samples from these two uh, random variables to update the hidden state, right? So this is the transition function that has a sample of z and pi in it. This should be somewhere on the slide, there we go. Um, so yeah, the, the main difference really is, is here um, that you use uh, samples from both these distributions. Yes, so, um, yeah, this is collapsed. Uh, there's basically a Gaussian mixture model on top of it. And so this selects the Gaussian in the Gaussian mixture model and then you sample from that. So it basically, and also, yeah, let me try to summarize this in one sentence. So, yeah, the, the gradients don't flow entirely through this, right? They flow to the Gaussian mixture model and then there's a, a classification loss that's injected and that flows to the inputs. But yeah, I, do, I don't really have time to, to talk about all of that. Maybe you said that I missed it. What's the H intending for? H so that's the, um, the hidden state in an RNN, in right? So in, it, it, it encapsulates all the data up to time t minus one. Right, so um, yeah, this is this is standard in in recurrent networks. You take the input, you compute a hidden state, and then from the hidden state, you compute the prediction for the next time step. Okay, so last aspect that I do want to mention here is um, is that of course here to compute the new HT, you actually rely on the sample. And this, uh, if you remember my very first slide, kind of breaks the autoregressive property, right? Because now you need xt um, to compute x hat t. And that's what we don't want. So in comes actually a fairly important idea. That's that of um, a dynamic prior, right? So VAE uses just a, a Gaussian as prior. Um, but if you want to do this on time series, then you basically need a dynamic prior that is predictive of the next step. And so what we do is we, uh, we add two uh, auxiliary distributions, um, ztp and pi tp over here, um, and they're made predictive, right, by adding an additional KL term between uh, the pi's and the z's, right? So by making basically the, uh, the prior and the, uh, the current latent variables as similar as possible to each other, we assume that... Um, PZT and P pi T then become predictive of the next um, stroke element. And this then allows you to do inference without having access to X of T, right? So this restores the autoregressive property. So the, uh, you then sample instead of using, uh, in, instead of using XT to update this, you use samples from ZTP and, and pi TP. Let's have a little bit of fun uh, before, before I, uh, do I still have time? How are we doing? We're doing okay, right? Okay, very good. Um, so let's have a little bit of fun. Um, this is the abstract of the paper um, written in the handwriting of each of the authors. Um, I guarantee you that the data set does not contain my signature, <laughs> but it is available online, right? So. Um, uh, if you want to play around with this, uh, all, all my students are in the data set. Um, 
And here's uh, proof that this predictive uh, aspect actually works. So this is what I meant, what I showed earlier already. Um, this is actually an app that runs on an iPad. You write something. Um, the model, by necessity, right, like by disentangling style from content, learns um, the OCR task on on the site almost. Um, so we we pipe the content element, right? So the pi of t into an OCR software. Let me pl play that again. That was very fast. Um, which then. Oh, no, sorry, this is the wrong video. I'm talking about a different video. Here we don't do anything, no, no uh, text correction. All we show here is uh, basically the back and forth, right? So this connects to the slide that I had earlier. We recognize the text, the handwritten text, but not with an auxiliary model. This is a, a byproduct of the model, right? It has to understand the text. Um, then uh, the user goes away, edits the ASCII representation, um, and then we regenerate that sample by, uh, by running the model basically forward from, uh, from that time step. Right? And then you get different content, same style. And so you can do different things uh, going back and forth between ASCII and, and, and uh, handwritten text. How much text do you need to adapt to a new person's style? The whole word. Uh, so I don't so have to give you a big sample of so um, we train this with a few auxiliary signals, and one of them is pen up and pen down. So we actually know the word, uh, the word segments or segmentation for words. We don't know it for characters. Um, to learn my style, if I just were to put, put this there, would you be able to infer how I'd write that? Oh, you would have to be in, in the data set or someone who writes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We. Um, so yeah, this this depends a little bit. So you can do the same thing what uh, Alex Gravis and those guys did. You take the pre-trained model and bias it with new samples, and then probably I don't know if you write four or five sentences that would be enough. But um, if you want stable prediction, so if you want to generate a lot of text, then the biasing actually doesn't work, right? So it will then converge back to like a mean style because it doesn't have enough uh, evidence of your style. Um, and if you really want this to be stable, then you need quite a lot of your samples. I don't actually remember how many samples there are per, per user, but it took, I remember doing the data collection and it took about half an hour or so writing different samples. So it's, I don't know, 50 sentences, maybe 80. I don't remember exactly. Um, I mean, there is quite a lot of this semi-cursive in the data because that's how people write. Um, but if there's a very, if the pen up event is very sparse, it fails actually. So it kind of converges to like a mean scribble. Um, and fully cursive is is actually very very difficult. Um, yeah, we ev even. I think the IM, IM on DB, which is actually the core of the data set, so we augmented the IM on DB data set, has uh, fully cursive samples. Um, and those we excluded because it's very difficult to model and there's not enough of them. Um, yeah. So you have the, in there, the E is written in two different styles <laughs> within this style. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, is, it, is it multimodal in the sense that you can sample from different styles within a style? Yes, so if you regenerate with the same style vector, it is truly a stochastic model, so it will produce different samples every time. And this is one of the things, one of the unwanted side effects that eventually, or sometimes it changes uh, from especially A's, right? So this is, I guess, the Germanic way of writing an A. If you grew up in Italy, you write it uh, differently, um, and it switches this occasionally, although it keeps the same slant and and things. So th this, uh, yeah, this is an unwanted side effect. Did you try to enhance the data set with uh, different characters and different symbols? Um, if you did it, did it improve or is it worse, the, the performance? So I'm what do you mean by enhance? If you try to write the sentence in another language that doesn't have like the English characters. Mm. 
So, um, I mean, okay, so in principle, the stochastic uh, latent space should make it more robust to noise in the training data. And I would say, if you look at IMMDB, it's very noisy, right? It's recorded with some weird laser pointer on some camera-based uh, uh, whiteboard. And it's, yeah, low sampling rate. It's, it's really not very nice. And then our data set is recorded with an iPad, right? The state-of-the-art digitizer. Um, has actually very nice ink, um, and that seemed to be that seemed to be beneficial, right? That you have different quality of samples in the training data. Um, so, in principle, I would say yes, it does help if you have you know more more variance. Um, we do we did not do any experiments with non Latin characters because we didn't have any data. We do have uh, people that you know no, write. Uh, Chinese characters or whatnot, but we don't have enough data. With the Chinese characters, it would be more difficult. Yes. With, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, I don't know with Arabic or this, but like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, stroke ordering and all these kind of things are super difficult. So uh, here it's real. You see that it actually picks up dynamics of when it puts the dot on an I, for example, and it does, the other part of your question was punctuation. It does learn to occasionally insert a, a period or a question mark. Sometimes it inserts this halfway into the sentence if you let it auto-generate, right? So if you provide the, as the, the content, then of course not. But if you just generate, uh, for example, you give it a seed sequence and let it continue, then occasionally it'll put a question mark or exclamation mark halfway into the sentence. So it, it learns that these things exist in the distribution, but of course there's no language model or anything. Um, okay, so, uh, so and this is actually, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you compare um, the stochastic, uh, stochastic RNNs uh, on many temporal tasks, they actually outperform LSTMs by, or by a large margin. And that's actually why I wanted to talk about this. Um, because, yeah, there's a very powerful, uh, powerful model for time series modeling, um, still with quite a bit of tricks, fulfills this autoregressive property. Um, the one downside of, of this particular approach is that it's super expensive to train. Yeah, so uh, it takes very, very long time. Um, you have to play all sorts of tricks with terms of sequence links because you have to fit it into memory, so it's uh, slow to train um, and uh, uh, finicky to train on top of that. It comes from the stochastic nature uh, and very memory, um, very memory hungry. So uh, to conclude, what I do want to talk about is an obvious uh, follow-up idea, I would say. If you've worked with stochastic RNNs and uh, you've heard about uh, temporal convolutional networks, you might, may be tempted to just go and say, well, I want all these properties, right? I want the computational efficiency um, and the expressivity of, of uh, wavenet-like architectures, um, and I want the modeling power of variational uh, models, and, and that's exactly what Emre did. Um, this is a paper from iClear from this year where we basically take the idea of a stoch stochastic latent space embedded into a temporal convolutional network, um, which then gives you a fairly powerful uh, time series model. So a uh, quick recap, right? Like WaveNet uh, uses these dilated co uh, convolutions to compute um, basically a deterministic, sorry, deterministic representation of T given uh, the time time series up to t minus 1. And uh, so what, what we propose is basically a direct uh, plug-in. So you can take WaveNet or other um, TCN, uh, TCN models or even an RNN, anything that has this property that it produces these summations of uh, previous time steps and then combine it um, with a variational or a, a stochastic module. Right? Um, so the same thing happens, right? Given all the uh, samples up to t minus 1, 
we uh, use the, the same building blocks, actually the code from WaveNet, um, to deterministically uh, compute these, uh, these intermediate representations, right? And um, the, the, the idea is that each layer kind of encapsulates a different um, scale of the time series, right? So here, here you have very, uh, very short-term um, effects, and then the higher you go, uh, the larger the receptive field, and the more um, long-term effect should matter. Right? And then at each of these levels, we basically introduce a stochastic uh, random variable, which we update using the deterministic uh, summary of the inputs um, via, uh, via a simple neural network. Right? So we take uh, the summary of the, of the inputs, dt minus 1, um, and uh, a sample from the random variable above, and compute mean and uh, variance of a, of a Gaussian um, via a neural network, right? So, um, and then you basically rinse and repeat. You do ancestral sampling. So uh, this is a standard technique in, in VAEs, in hierarchical VAEs, where you just have several layers of, um, of latent variables. And so you, you always take the deterministic uh, part computed by WaveNet. You update the Z. Um, using that deterministic part and a sample that's drawn from uh, the layer above. And then uh, you continue this um, all the way to the bottom, and then the final uh, conditional probability is then uh, conditioned on all disease above, right? So uh, this is a, a trick that, you know, DenseNet, for example, uses uh, where you basically, uh, where you basically so these errors are for purely for performance reasons, right? So technically, the ancestral sampling should contain all the information that you need to, to uh, make the prediction for a time step t, um, but adding these dense connections uh, just improve the performance of the model. So what is the f function for That's, that's just a MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, so a neural network. That it computes the mean and the, the variance of the random variable. So this is, it just takes the, the deterministic part, computes a uh, mean and variance, and then we sample from it. That's the update of the random variable, basically. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a single layer neural network. Um, and so, so a few important um, aspects here. There's no internal state, right? So there's no more transition function. Um, the latent variable ZT L are conditioned vertically. They're not conditioned across time steps at all, right? So they're really independent of each other. And this is, well, this is the, the reason why this is computationally efficient. Um, this is also the biggest problem that um, I don't actually have, have uh, evidence for this, but if you try to predict for a long time, this relatively quickly diverges, right? Because there's no explicit modeling of, of temporal dependencies. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, so this is the generative model. This is basically what you use to produce new samples. Um, for training, um, you need an inference model. And here we actually, well, implicitly introduce temporal uh, dependency. Right, so, uh, oops, this is a repetition. Here's the uh, inference model. So um, what we do is basically, first you compute the approximate likelihood, and then you correct the estimate via a prior, right? Um, so I'll have this graphically that's maybe easier uh, to look at. So here, um, everything is only up to t minus one, so that's basically the generative model. And then during training, you actually have access to uh, the t's time step, so the current time step. But uh, later, when you want to use this model, that you, you don't have access to this. So on the left-hand side, we do the same thing that I described earlier for the uh, generative part. Um, and on the right-hand part, um, we basically compute a prior um, from, the current, um, from the current time t. Uh, sorry, approximate posterior. This, this is the prior from previous time 
an uh, approximate posterior, and then we do a precision weighted update, which then gives you um, a, a ZTQ, so an approximate posterior, um, that is basically correct. So you correct the likelihood estimate that you get from the generative model with information from the current time step. Um, but we only do this, of course, at training time, right? So this information you don't have at runtime, but the training process makes the ZT predictive, at least over short time horizons. And then you uh, rinse and repeat, basically. So at every layer, the, the process is exactly the same. Um, and in the end, you end up with a, a ZT that we assume is the same as the, the true posterior, right? There's nothing that we really do to enforce this, um, but we assume that it uh, approximates the true posterior. So, uh, yeah, there's two aspects to this. There's um, the inference model that's only used at training time, and then the generative model where you throw away the right-hand side and only use uh, the, the prior, the ZTPs, um, to predict novel samples. Um, yeah, and so if you look at kind of uh, this, the performance of lots of uh, state-of-the-art models, here now higher is better. Um, you see kind of WaveNet up there, uh, 30,000 WaveNet dense. That's the same like using our trick with dense connections. Basically, um, the VRNN uh, is a little, a little worse than uh, WaveNet on the same data set. Um, here are models, so uh, between these two bars, they actually have information from the past and the future, so they're bidirectional models, um, which incre increases the performance, and then down here is ours and on, on different data sets. So this is Timid, Blizzard, um, IMONDB, and our own, uh, the deep writing data set that I talked, talked about before, um, outperforms a, a large number of models, yeah. It's, it's Gaussian, yeah. Everything is assumed to be Gaussian. Uh, there's um, <laughs> KL divergence terms um, across the vertical hierarchy, not across time scales. Okay, but it's just a single Gaussian, not a Gaussian scale mixture. No, a single Gaussian in this case, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, I think in the paper, no, not in the paper, in the appendix, we have experiments with um, output uh, layers that use a Gaussian mixture model. Um, because often, um, in particular, the, the RNN variants perform much better if you have a Gaussian mixture in the output. Um, I th yeah, I'm pretty sure this is still in the appendix. Uh, but yeah, it's this, the same picture, basically. So there's, yeah, there's an extended table that either uses single Gaussian output or Gaussian mixture, but the order doesn't really change. On some data sets it does, in, like in this range here. Um, but uh, overall, the picture remains the same. Mm -hmm. Can you try to uh, apply your model for uh, slightly higher dimensional sequential data, for example, for example human motion data, to, to, separa to separate the cell and content in some sense? Yes. Um, we, well, I mean, we're doing this right now. Um, it, it depends on the time scale. Uh, so the, the problem that we have right now is that it, produce, it produces very high quality samples for a short time period and then completely diverges. And this is because there's no explicit um, modeling, right? Of but for human motion, how, what's the content? Like, how, how, how do you define that? Like, still, I can understand, for example, how have a different way of doing something. But so the motion, we use the motion modeling data set. So H36M, right, has sequences of poses. And so we feed in poses and then predict poses into the future. Yeah, okay. So you did mean a different task, yeah? No, no, I mean this task, but I yeah. just wonder how to distangle the style and the content. content. Oh, you mean the previous, the, the yeah. stochastic VRN. And I actually have, um, I actually have a video of this. Um, so this is uh, the, the stochastic VRNN on simple. Um, and this is kind of, I don't actually know here, somewhere the seed sequence stops, and then we just let it run, and it kind of discovers, it sometimes even switches activity. So it, this looks like window uh, cleaning. Um, here, I think like it looks like it's getting onto some sort of swing or 
or a ladder. Um, and so the, the stochastic VRNN actually produces pretty good motion over, so at, at this point it's predicting. Yeah. So that actually looks like it's predicting, it's almost copying or memorizing the input. that motion, those motions are in the data set. Yeah, so this is very possible that it's memorizing a lot of it, and this is unpublished work for exactly that reason, that we don't quite know yet which, how much is true generation and how much is, uh, is um, is memorization, and uh, anyway, so this is all ongoing work. So we're we're doing both uh, ex or experiments with both models, with the stochastic VRNN and the sto stochastic TCN on various pose-related tasks, hands and, and full body. Um, the C VRNN produces, as you say, almost too good to be true results, uh, and the STCN produces very good results in very short time frames. <laughs> Um, but not on, on longer time frames. So we'll have to we'll have to combine the advantages of both uh, before we before we get some, somewhere. But this is all um, unfinished, un, unpublished work. So I don't know yet. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, that, that's about it. Uh, I'll, I, the, the both papers and code and models for all of this are online, if you're interested. Um, in summary, what we talked about is basically a larger family of autoregressive models that I think in computer vision gets too little attention because they're very promising. I like them because they're simple, um, because they give you an explicit density function. You can compare generative models numerically. It's not a replacement for qualitative analysis. Um, yeah, and they're typically um, easy to train, um, easy to sample, um, of course, sometimes uh, sampling can be slow because you have to run the model many, many times. And it depends on the, in the STC and also on the, on the depths of your network. Um, yeah, and I, I can't really show you this yet, but in our lab we're actually working on applying these on many different uh, vision tasks, and some of them look, uh, look promising. Um, and I'd be excited to see more of this in, in computer vision and, and human motion modeling. And that's it for me. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer more questions.